Gee, it's really beautiful out here. I'm glad you're taking me on this nature walk. Yeah, me too. See over there? No, to your right. That's a white-tailed deer. There's a lot of them in this area, and my teacher says they're native to this ecosystem. So what's an ecosystem? We study ecosystems in seventh grade. Well, an ecosystem is where things interact and work together to support life. An ecosystem includes both living things, like plants and animals, and the non-living things around them. Non-living things? Sounds like something out of a horror movie. <laughs> yeah, it does, doesn't it? In an ecosystem, non-living things means the physical elements of the area. The air, the amount of light, rainfall, rocks, things like that. So you put all those together with the living things and you get an ecosystem that, what'd you say, it supports life? Yeah, that's right. Remember when we took that excursion trip on Lake Michigan? Yeah, that was fun. Lake Michigan is a whole ecosystem, and a big one too. Most people think of ecosystems as big places like oceans, rainforests, deserts, and grasslands. In fact, you can think of this whole planet Earth as a giant ecosystem, because we can live here. But an ecosystem could be small, too. You mean like that puddle over there? Would that be an ecosystem? Yeah, that could be. That puddle probably has algae growing around the edges. And I imagine there are mosquitoes that call it home sweet home. As long as it has whatever the animals and plants need to live, it's an ecosystem. It's hard to imagine a puddle supporting all that life. Yeah, I know. But you can find biodiversity almost anywhere. Biodiversity? Hey, I just started understanding what ecosystems are. Biodiversity isn't so hard. It means all of the variety of life on Earth. These are all prairie plants, but there are many different species here. All of these species give us one kind of variety. There's variety found in most all plants and animals. Like that monarch butterfly over there? Yeah. That's a monarch butterfly, but there are many different species of butterflies. And each monarch butterfly is slightly different from another, just like there are differences among people. The genes from our mother and father combined to make us slightly different from our parents. Remember the variety of animals and plants we've seen today? Yeah, we saw a blue spotted salamander, a garter snake, bees, the white-tailed deer, and what was that flower we saw with the little white petals? Shooting stars. There's a lot of variety of life in this ecosystem. In fact, biodiversity also includes the many different kinds of ecosystems. You mean places like rainforests, deserts, and grasslands are examples of biodiversity? That's right. Biodiversity means variety, and ecosystems are all different from each other. Up ahead, you'll notice that the grassland where we've been walking will begin to change. How do you mean? Well, we're going to come to the edge of the forest, and where the grassland meets the forest, it's called an edge. An edge, huh? Okay. Sometimes an edge is where one ecosystem blends gradually into the next, like where a pond meets a prairie. There's usually a wet, squishy area where they meet. Or an edge might be small patches of land that look a little like both ecosystems. You mean like grassland that has a few trees where it's beginning to be a forest? That's right. Edges can be natural, or they can be artificial if they're made by people. So what causes a natural edge? Well, for example, it might be differences in the kind of soil or it could be changes in the way water drains from the soil, a geological effect like that. If you look right over by the water, you'll see a natural ledge. The canyon wall is rock, but at the bottom is soil, and then, of course, you have the water from the stream running along. So the edge is the area between the land and the water. Oh, I understand. I remember last summer our family went to Indiana Dunes, so where the lake meets the land, would that be an edge? Sure, that's right. There are many examples of ecosystem edges right here in this area. You see, the conditions in each of these edges are affected by the ecosystems around them. It's called an edge effect. Okay, time for an explanation. It means the conditions in an edge are affected by whatever is happening in the ecosystems around it. 
things like the temperature, the amount of sunlight, and the humidity. So the environment in the edge area is usually in between those environments. The temperature at the edge might be somewhere between the temperature in the middle of the forest and the temperature in the middle of the prairie. So is that good for the edge? Well, it makes a good place to live for some plants and animals. Edges are full of life because they combine the plants and animals from the ecosystems that surround them. Sounds like quite a combination. It is. See, a variety of plants means that there's a variety of habitats for lots of different kinds of animals. I see. Lots of different plants in an edge means lots of different animals. Right. And with all those different habitats, a lot of animals depend on edges for their food and a place for their nesting sites. So you said there are natural edges and artificial ones? That's right. It can take a long time for natural edges to form, but artificial edges may happen very quickly. They're caused by people who clear land for farms or homes, or build ponds or parks. And highways? Yeah, for highways too. The thing about artificial edges made by humans is that they're really abrupt compared to natural edges. What do you mean abrupt? Well, there's usually no gradual changeover from one ecosystem to the other. And people have to maintain artificial edges too. And that's because? Because artificial edges have to be kept up by people. The path through a forest needs to be kept clear. The grass around your house needs to be cut. Otherwise, the ecosystem will eventually go back to its natural state. Can you give me an example? Sure. A good example of an edge is on a farm. Maybe 50 or 100 years ago, some people cut down trees at the edge of a forest so they could start a farm and plant crops. But if that land isn't plowed and planted every year or so, eventually the farmland will again grow trees and the forest will grow back. I get it. So because that farm on the edge of the forest isn't a natural edge, it has to be plowed and maintained as a farm? Yeah, that's right. The need for maintenance is how you can tell that an area is an artificial edge. Without maintenance, even a road at the edge of a forest will be taken over eventually, but it will take a long time. Hey, Jake, look over there. Isn't that a raccoon in the log? Right. Raccoons are edge animals. They hide in the trees or burrows during the day. Then they'll come out at night to find food in open areas and edges, and to hunt for frogs, fish, fruits, nuts, birds, and eggs. Cool. There are many animals that live in the edge of ecosystems. They're called edge species. Some are predators, like that hawk in the tree. Hawks nest in trees along the edge and sit on the branches waiting for a meal to come by. What kind of meal? Something like a mouse, small bird or rabbit, you know. When the hawk sits in the trees, it has a good view of animals on the ground, especially in open places like you see along edges. The next time you're riding in a car along a country road with woods or farmland on the side, keep an eye out. You'll probably see a hawk. Those poor little animals, they're like little targets out there. Well, animals have to eat. And without top predators like hawks, we would have way too many rats and mice running around. So I guess edge predators can help an ecosystem? They sure can, but too many edges means that there can be more edge predators and that can put the ecosystem out of balance. Another edge species you see a lot of around here is the woodchuck. Did you ever look out the window when you're driving in a car and see some small animals at the side of the road in the grass? Woodchucks come out of the forest and look for food in the grass near the road. Can all plants or animals live in edge areas? No, there are lots of them that don't do well. If a species needs a certain kind of food or soil condition that isn't available in an edge area, it might be an interior species. That means they live well in the middle of ecosystems, but they can't survive in edge areas. In class, we also learned about something called fragmentation. It's really bad for the planet. Fragmentation sounds like something getting chopped into pieces. You got it. What's happening is that ecosystems are getting divided into pieces, and those pieces are getting smaller and smaller. This can happen when land is developed to build homes, when trees are cut down for the forest industry, lots of ways. That's bad, right? It's definitely not good, because when a larger ecosystem is cut into smaller pieces, we don't have a big area for animals that need to live on large chunks of land. Eventually, those species will become extinct or move out. And that's happening in this area? Yeah, it's happening all over the world. In Europe, Africa, South America, you name it. Ecosystems get broken up so people can farm and feed more people every year. 
And that means? There's less space for other plants and animals. Not only less space. Fragmentation of a whole ecosystem means there are more edges. And more edges means more what? More edge species. Right. Okay, I have a question for you. When something bad happens to an ecosystem in South America or wherever, does it affect us? That's the thing. It affects all of us because it breaks the connections that tie the whole world together. I don't understand how that works. Okay, here's an example. Remember when the temperature of the Pacific Ocean got warmer during El Nino? It affected not just the fish in that ocean, but the weather all over the world because everything is connected. You mean the land and the oceans and the air? Everything? Everything. El Nino even affected the price of food we eat. The price of food? How? It changed the temperature of the ocean, which kept fish from reproducing, which made it harder for fishermen to catch them, and eventually made the fish we buy more expensive. Wow, I guess everything is connected. Well, it's getting late. We should probably be going while we can still see our way down the path. Hey, thanks. This is fun. I learned lots of cool stuff. One of the activities you'll be doing is a transect study of edge effect near your school. To find edge effect, you need to have an edge, the place where two kinds of habitats come together. The edge may be where a road meets some trees, or it could be the woods along a park or next to your school. Wherever your edge is, your job will be the same, to see if you can find differences in temperature, humidity, wind speed, and other physical characteristics between two habitats. To do that, you'll be gathering, recording, and analyzing data. When you've found two habitats near your school, pick a spot between them, such as this edge where woods meet a grassy park. Notice how the plants where the students are working are taller than the grass in the foreground, but shorter than the trees in the background. That's a good way of knowing you're at an edge. To begin your study, measure an edge area that is two meters on each side. Mark the corners of the square with flags. This is your first study site. Once you've marked the study site, you'll begin taking measurements. What's the temperature in your study site five centimeters above the ground? How about one meter above the ground? Is there a temperature difference? You will use a thermometer or temperature probe to take measurements that will help you answer these questions. You'll be using equipment to take other measurements at the study site too, such as humidity and light density. This student is using an anemometer which measures wind speed. What happens if you take the same data at a site away from the edge? Will the temperature and humidity be different? What about wind speed? To help answer these questions, other students will be setting up study sites at different distances from the edge. Here, students are using a meter stick to establish a second study site out in the grassy area away from the edge. Study site 2 is set up the same way as the first one, and the same measurements are taken for comparison with the edge site. When your class is done measuring the characteristics of five study sites, you'll be able to answer some questions. Were there edge effects? Were the differences greater at some sites than at others? By graphing your data, you'll be able to answer these questions and to begin thinking about other questions, such as, what impact do edge effects have on whole ecosystems? What about on ecosystems that are divided into fragments? During your field trip to Brookfield Zoo, some of you will be doing animal behavior observations. Understanding how animals behave is key to providing them a good home at the zoo and in a nature reserve. The Living Coast is an exhibit about the connections in the coastal ecosystem of Peru and Chile in South America. 
This exhibit features some of the fascinating creatures that live along the coast where one of the world's richest oceans meets the driest desert. One of the animals you will see at the living coast are Humboldt penguins. There are different ways to do animal behavior observations. At the near shore waters, you will be doing a scan sample. A scan sample looks at all behaviors for a group of animals in a single scan. Scan the water from bottom to top and look for the behaviors listed on your worksheet. Note what each penguin is doing as you come to it. Do five complete scans of the penguins at the near shore waters exhibit. You'll be looking for penguins that are diving, swimming, and feeding. Over at the rocky shores, you'll be doing another scan sample of the penguin colony. Scan the rocks from left to right and look for all behaviors listed on your worksheet. You'll be looking for penguins that are diving, swimming, walking, standing, and flapping their wings as well as other behaviors. Sometimes you'll see a behavior that is not listed, such as this courting behavior. Record that data in the column labeled Other. Now that you've learned how to do behavior observations on Humboldt penguins, you'll apply the same techniques to animals in the African savanna. At Habitat Africa, some of you will do a scan sample of one of the most endangered mammals in the world, African wild dogs. This scan sample is similar to the ones that you did at the Living Coast. Scan the exhibit from left to right and look for animals that are moving. Moving includes running, jumping on rocks, and walking. Like all mammals, wild dogs need to rest. Scan also for animals that are sitting or lying down. When wild dogs play, they're building social bonds and developing hunting skills. You'll recognize play when you scan for it. You'll also be scanning for wild dogs that are feeding. Hunting in packs makes them one of the most efficient predators, catching their prey 60% of the time. When you can't identify a behavior, record the data in the column labeled Other. Do five scans of the wild dogs. These five scans equal one complete observation. Some of you will be observing Grant's zebra. An important part of animal behavior research is being able to identify individuals. All zebras may look alike at first glance, but a closer look shows that each individual has its own distinctive stripe pattern, especially on the flanks and above the shoulder. It will be your job to identify individual zebras based on these patterns. After you've identified a zebra, you'll observe its behavior. This is a focal sample. Now you'll make timed observations of one animal instead of the whole group. Since these are timed observations, work with a partner and use a stopwatch to tell your partner when 15 seconds has passed. You should note what your zebra is doing every 15 seconds by recording the behavior on your activity sheet. One of the behaviors you'll be watching for is moving. Moving includes walking and running. You'll also be looking for feeding. Zebras standing still or lying down are resting. As before, if one of the behaviors you see does not appear on your activity sheet, record it in the other category. Stop the activity after five minutes. At the Aardvark exhibit, some of you will be learning how to tell individuals apart. Aardvarks have different markings on their bodies. Some may be caused by burrowing underground or from escaping a predator. You'll also do a location observation. Draw an overhead map of the exhibit in the space provided on your worksheet. Then note the location of the aardvarks in the exhibit every 15 seconds by placing an X on the map. After five minutes, you'll have an idea of how the animals are using their exhibit space. At the end of each animal behavior activity, you'll be asked to relate what you learn at the zoo to a more natural area with fewer boundaries and more animals. Why is it important to understand an animal's behavior in a zoo or in a nature reserve? 
Why is it important to be able to identify individual animals in a zoo or in a nature reserve? As a final activity, you'll be designing a nature reserve for African wild dogs, grant zebras, and aardvarks. So pay close attention to these animals at Brookfield Zoo. Now I'm about that, a that, 16th that now, inch a little bit long. Well, that'll go in front of the bears now. Some of you will be investigating how the zoo communicates with its visitors, even famous visitors. If you are in this group, use your activity sheet to find six communication methods in the Living Coast. The zoo uses different ways to appeal to the many ways that people learn. Sometimes it may be with touch, with sight, or sound. Or a combination of our senses, sight, sound, touch, taste, and smell. Your job is to find out how the zoo uses different senses to inform visitors about animals and the environment. On your activity sheet, you'll also write down why you think the messages being delivered might be important. For example, why should people here know about the coast of South America? At Habitat Africa, repeat the search for communication methods using the third page of your worksheet. At the zoo, adult supervisors will be supplied maps to guide you around the exhibit. Record at least five communication methods that you find. Some may be simple and appeal to just one sense, while those along the Thirsty Animal Trail, a part of Habitat Africa, encourage visitors to use several senses, because people learn in different ways. At the end of your trip to Brookfield Zoo, some of you will be on your way to becoming animal experts. Others will be able to understand how the zoo helps people learn about animals and ecosystems and why it's important. Back in your classroom, you'll be putting what you've learned to use to design a nature reserve. 